Don't go ordering a hundred dollars worth of commissary when you first get there. You need to fill the place out, be established before you go do that. You go ordering a hundred dollars worth of stuff, you're going to get robbed. And don't ever give anybody your phone, account numbers. Keep all your stuff personal. And always look over your shoulder. Because they'll snipe your numbers from across the room. Tip number two. When you're new coming into the cell, say you come in at 8 o'clock at night, so your first meal will be breakfast. When you get up for breakfast, I would be the last one in line because everybody has seats where they want to sit with their friends. So if you go just sitting in somebody's seat, you might have a problem on your first day in a new dorm or 10-man pod, whichever one it is. Tip number three, don't touch the TV and do not stay on the phone for long periods of time, especially if you have somebody else waiting because that could end up being a problem for you later on. Tip number four, if you only have like a 60-day sentence, don't go around talking about your time, how much you got, you're stressed out or what's going on outside because you got people that are in there that don't even know how much time they're facing 50 years you don't know what other people's going through I know when I was in jail I didn't want to hear no short time or crying about they had to do two weeks when I had five years so you just got to be mindful of you don't know what everybody else is going through and just kind of keep that to yourself. Tip number five, keep your head down and your eyes open. And that means just lay low. Don't bring attention to yourself, but always be aware of your surroundings and what's going on. Being in jail, you can learn a lot by not saying anything and just watching. But you don't, you don't want to watch too much either. So, you got to kind of watch what you do in jail. It all depends on your situation. Let's jump straight into it. Soon as you get out of that cop car in the sally port, you'll go in a little room and you'll be boxed in with two doors. The COs will pat you down. They take everything from you. Your cell phone, your wallet, if the cop hasn't already, whatever else is left in your pockets, they take. Your shoes, I guess it's a liability, they don't want you to have your shoelaces. Now not all jails, I have been in Ohio where they let me keep my shoes, which that was very weird to me because I was used to them always taking my shoes. If you get locked up on a weekend, the booking process might be hours. If you're lucky, you'll get through it pretty quick. Usually they set you down in some uncomfortable plastic seats, book you in, they'll take your photograph, your fingerprints, they'll take all your information, and once that happens they'll usually give you a free phone call or They'll give you a phone card with like five free minutes on it so you can call whoever you need to call once you get in the cell. Sometimes they say they ran out and you just don't get a phone card. So you just better hope and pray that somebody else that has one don't need it or you get lucky enough to get out the next morning. We're going to go with you got a non-violent, pretty serious crime. You might be looking at a little bit of time. So after you get booked in, they're going to throw you in the drunk tank. Every drunk tank smells like a dirty, nasty sock. I don't know. <laughs> I've never seen one that smells any different. It's just nasty. Most jails, you will set in there for up to three days. Sometimes even a week. 
Heck, I've seen jails so overpopulated, they keep people in there for two weeks. And we're talking like a little 10 by 10 room, no beds, no nothing, just a concrete slab that you sit on with a toilet in there with 10, 15 people. It's very uncomfortable, very unsanitary. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. You get out of the drunk tank, they usually take you to an assessment cell. Usually they have a 10-man cell that they throw you in for a few days to a week. And it's got the TV, hot pot, toilet. But you cannot get commissary in the assessment pod. Now the assessment pod, what you're waiting on is for them to assess your risk level. Some jails go by your age, some go by race, to figure out who they want to put you with. The last time I was locked up, I was 32 years old, and they threw me in the young man dorm with a bunch of 18-year-olds. When I should have been in the middle age dorm, but somehow I got stuck with all the young bucks for a few weeks. To now, if you're a high risk, or you have a very violent crime, an unspeakable crime, you will go straight to the hole. So most jails put you with your age group. Or, I've seen it where they literally just throw you in with anybody. But once you get in the cell, if it's a 10-man pod, it's going to be very obvious if there's a bunk open or not. And it seems to be that 10-man pods, the people are more friendly than it is with a 70 or 80-man dorm. And I think that's just because it's just a lot more people. When there's only a 10-man cell, they're kind of glad to see a new face, wondering if you got money on your account. So you can get some ramen noodles and honey buns in there. Maybe you'll share with them. <laughs> uh. The first way to make money in jail is to run a store. Running a store is very frustrating. And it is just what it sounds like. You're literally running a store. Say when you come in, you have $100 on your account. You will take by 30 noodles... 10 honey buns, 10 Mountain Dews, 5 Pepsis, whatever you want in your store. And when somebody else is waiting to go to the store, but they have money on their account, they've already placed their order, and you double check that because they will rip you off or lie to you. They come to you and they'll say, hey, I want two noodles till Thursday and you'll do something like two for four. So you give them two noodles on Monday, they gotta give you four noodles on Thursday. You're taxing them. But that's how you run your store. In jail, food is currency. Unless you're in a class D camp and actually have cash. But if you're in the county jail, food is currency in there. The second way to make money in jail is doing laundry. While I was locked up, I ran across a few cats that that's what they did every day. They did people's laundry and they made an all right, decent living at it. But you got to have more than one customer. You got to have like five or six, or every few days you at least got some income coming in, two or three noodles just to keep you going. Because the food in jail is horrible, they give you small portions. Raymond Noodles is lifesavers in there. The third way to make money in jail is you could sew people's clothes or whatever they need sewed. Now how you sew people's clothes up in jail, they don't give you a needle and sewing kit in there. So you got to take the string out of your uniform, get a comb, and break one of the ends off and poke a hole in it, and you can use that as a needle. Now there's not tons of people in jail that want something sewed, but if you can sew, do laundry, you can make a decent little hustle when somebody does need all this stuff done. If them shirts don't come back crispy white, they're definitely
going to go to the next man that's hungry. The fourth way people make money in jail is selling tobacco. Tobacco is the number one seller in jail. Usually when people first go in jail, that's what they're looking for. They want a cigarette or a dip. It seems like almost everybody that's locked up smokes or dips. So as soon as they get in the jail, they're looking for tobacco. It's usually everywhere. In my experience, if you're in the dorm, it's usually dip that's flowing around pretty heavy. But if you're in a 10-man pod, it's cigarettes. You can take one Newport 100 and break that down to four or five cigarettes and sell them for $5 a piece. So you can make pretty good money off cigarettes in county jail. Dip goes for a couple dollars a pouch. Depending on how much is in the dorm at the time, if there's a lot of it, you might only get a dollar a piece out of them. But if there's none around, you could probably get $3 to $4 out of one dip. It depends on how bad they want it and how much of it's around. Fifth way to make money in jail, you could sell t-shirts, socks, wife beaters, boxers. If you've been in there a while, you know everybody in the dorm. So if you buddy up to some people, when they go to leave, they will leave you their whites. They'll leave you their noodles, whatever they got, they will leave it all to you. I have seen people take their state bowls, their state soap, everything home with them, their Raymond noodles which is crazy to me. I don't know why you would want to take that stuff home with you. You're supposed to leave that for the next man. Every time I got out, I would always go to the guy that I knew needed it the most, and I would leave him everything. Now, if I had a really good buddy in there that asked me, hey, can I get that t-shirt, I would give it to him. So if you're in there a little bit, you got that buddy system going, when they go to get out, they'll leave you whites and you can turn around and sell them for a profit and that brings me to my next way to make money in county jail and it's one of the biggest money makers in county jail poker goes on all day long and if you don't have no money when you go in you could wash somebody's clothes sell a tray get a couple noodles get in on the game if you're any good at playing poker, but once you see the judge and he hands down that sentence and you think your life's over, you get that pit in your stomach, you literally feel like your world's crashing down, they will send you back to the cell and you will have to remain there until you are assessed by Department of Corrections. There are a few jails that will work you while you're waiting on your level to come back. Of course, you will have to stay inside the jail, work the hallways or the kitchen, laundry, something like that. It's a lot better than being inside the cell stuck all day. If the jail you're in don't offer that, it usually takes three or four weeks for your level to come back. The level system at Department of Corrections is one, two, and three. Level one is minimum, level two is medium, level three is max. If you come back a level three, you will never work outside of the jail. Some jails might work you inside the hallway or the kitchen or the laundry room, but that's not all jails. Some jails will not work you at all if you come back a level three. If you're a level one or two, they will send you to the camp. If you're asking yourself, well, why would I have to wait three weeks if I already got sentenced? Well, you're waiting on Department of Corrections to give you an assessment. It's a risk assessment and a health assessment. They want to see what kind of physical health you're in. you got to do a physical, and if you don't pass the physical, you don't work. They will call you out and take you up and dress you out kind of like you're getting out, but they won't give you your wallet. They'll just give you your clothes and shoes, basically. Usually, the camp is located right next to the jail or maybe it might be less than a mile away it's pretty close sometimes the camp is inside the jail they'll just call a dorm and say that's class D if the jail you're in actually has a camp that is not located inside the jail they will transport you to the class D now once you get in there 
more than likely you're already going to know some cats that are in there from where you had done time inside the jail. You're going to see people at rec, church, whatever kind of activities you get involved with while you're inside the jail. So you meet people, you'll get to know people. So once you get to the camp, nine times out of ten, you're going to know quite a few people that are in there which is good because they will help you out, kind of show you the ropes. Depending on how many jobs they have, you might go to work straight away if they need people. But if they're kind of full and they just took you because your level was ready, then you might have to wait a few weeks or I've seen people wait a month to get a job. But it's still a lot better than being inside the jail. The food is a lot better. They usually feed their workers pretty good. I know a lot of people think, well, you're working for the state, you must be making some money. Well, you do make money while you're working for the state as an inmate. They take four days off your sentence for working 30 days. Each month that you work, you get four days off. Now, a lot of people think, well, heck, that ain't nothing. But if you work a whole year, that adds up. That's a month and a half off your sentence. That helps out, especially if you got a three or five year sentence. Now, the state pay usually takes, they kind of hold a month back, so it usually takes a couple months to get your first state pay check. But I wouldn't get too excited about it because it only equals out to like 30 days in the month. You're going to get about 1260, 1270, somewhere around there. It's literally just enough to get deodorant, toothpaste, and maybe a couple noodles or something. So to somebody that don't have family that will come and bring them money, that is like your lifeline. You need that deodorant. You need that toothpaste. You might look forward to getting a Mountain Dew once a month. So once you get in there, they will assign you a rack and a locker. And on the weekends, usually it's on Saturday or Sunday, they'll split the dorm up and they'll tell you which day you can have visitors. But you can have your family bring up your clothes. At most of the camps, not all the camps, some of the camps you still have to wear uniforms so you can't get clothes. I've only been in one camp that you can't have contact visits. The Class D was located inside the jail in a regular dorm. All the other ones had a camp, an actual camp that was located right next to it or half a mile down the road. Most of them you're allowed to carry cash. They have vending machines inside. If there's cash involved, there's tobacco flowing freely inside the camp. And usually there's drugs flowing also. So I don't know what your priorities are, but I would probably stay away from that situation because I've seen stuff get pretty hairy inside. There ain't no reason to put yourself in a bad situation, especially in a camp where compared to jail, it's like being in the real world almost. So why would you want to risk anything and have to go back to a 70-man dorm or a 10-man cell and just be locked up in there. Some of the camps that I've been at, they have cornhole, they have basketball goals, they have their own little area outside that you can go to, and that's where most people do their smoking. Seems like most of the camps that I was in, they didn't really care too much about tobacco. They knew it was in there. They would just rather you smoke outside than inside. Heck, I've seen some of the COs lock up the whole camp until somebody came up with a can of dip for them. When you get to the camp, you'll see a completely different side of some of the COs that you came in contact with at the jail. They are completely laid back, where in the jail they were uptight assholes. I don't even know how those guys do their job. Like, I wonder if that was in the Indeed post when they filled out the application that you had to look at a hundred brown eyes in one day. <laughs> I would quit. I couldn't do it. The inside scoop of what people in county jail wait for, and that's commissary day. People cannot wait to get their commissary in so they can throw in with their buddies and make a big break. By the end of the day, you feel like you've accomplished something. Your belly's full. Everybody's happy. The main ingredient in any break in Kentucky is Grippos. You can find other people with the rest of the items that you want to throw in. 
I got a bunch of condiments laid out here. I'm not going to use all of them. I am more of a barbecue sauce man. But while I was locked up, we would take whatever we could get. If we could only find a pack of ranch dressing, we would use ranch. If we could only find a pack of mayonnaise, we would use mayonnaise. But whatever you prefer, you could use in your own break. Now the ramen noodle, you can get any kind that you want. I like to mix them up, the flavors a little bit. Chicken's kind of a plain taste. Beef kind of gives it a little kick. So I usually go with them two flavors together. They're not too bad. The other items that's a must have is pickles and summer sausage. In jail, if they don't offer summer sausage, usually they will offer like a teriyaki sticks. They're like two little sticks like this big for a couple bucks. We would get those and chop those up and throw those in the break. You could basically use whatever's on your commissary. But if you're in county jail, you really don't have a preference. It's whatever's around at the time. Every dorm or pod has a hot pot or some way for you to get hot water for your ramen noodles or coffee, whatever you need it for. I don't have that, so I'm just using boiling water. Okay, and that is how Kentuckians make a break in county jail. You can do it with very few ingredients, and it only costs five or six dollars to do it. More than likely, you have the stuff laying around your house to do it with. All you need is a couple of noodles, bag of grippos, summer sausage, or teriyaki sticks, pickles, and whatever condiments you want to put in there. If you don't have a summer sausage and you're a tuna person, you can make tuna too. You can put tuna, whatever you want, inside. I've got to try it out. delicious. Try it out for yourself and let me know in the comments down below what you think. If you like all jail related content, please hit that like and subscribe. I got a lot of new content coming your way. Thanks for watching Locked Up 365. Snitches get stitches, rat, something you don't want to be labeled in jail and if you did snitch people are going to find out and you're going to be in a world of hurt you're going to trick your time up it's really not worth it i would advise against it but if you didn't there are ways that people will think that you did so you need to try to avoid these at all costs and i'm going to be going over a few of them next it don't matter how long you've been in county jail, whether it's been a week, a day, a month, a year. You do not want to get too friendly with the guards. Once you've been in there a while, you'll know what guards are cool and you can associate a little bit with them. In some situations, it is good to have guards that you know will help you out, but you don't want to come across especially a new person in county jail. If you're too friendly with the guards, them guards are not going to save you. If anything, I've seen more guards throw people up underneath the bus. I've literally seen guards come in with people and say, hey, he's a snitch, or he checked out of the last cell. So them guards are not your friends. If people see you buddying up to the guard, or all the guards, for that matter, especially ones like guards that nobody likes, and you're buddy-buddy with them, you're tricking your time up because nobody's going to want to mess with you. They're thinking, in their own head, they're thinking that you're over there telling on them. You're finding out what you can about people in the cell, and you're snitching. That's what they're thinking. That's what I would think. So you don't want to be buddy-buddy with the guards. It's different if you ask a question and kind of go on your way. 
but they're not going to save you from everybody else. If you need a ramen noodle till Friday, they're not going to help you. The other inmates, those are going to be the ones that are going to be helping you. You're going to be doing business with. You're going to be living with. These are not in any particular order, but the next one is stealing. If you get caught stealing in jail, that is a huge no-no because nobody is going to want to talk to you. You go sit down to watch TV, they're either going to make you leave or everybody's going to get up. You're not going to be having a good time. And the best thing to do in jail is to have a good time. You want to play poker. You want to associate yourself with everybody. It makes your time go by faster. If you get caught stealing, you're done. Ain't nobody ever going to trust you. They're not going to want to deal with you. There's just no reason to trick your time up over a couple honey buns. There's always known thieves in the pot. They'll steal your phone numbers right out from over your shoulder, steal your honey buns, your noodles, or you could be strong-armed when you get your commissary. They literally steal. But nobody's going to help you. But nobody associates themselves with these people either. So don't ever get caught stealing. For this next one, especially when you first get into jail, a lot of people won't mind to help you out. But if you just go around bumming all day long every day and you don't ever get commissary and pay people back, after a few days, maybe a week if you last that long of getting shots of coffee off different people, Eventually, everybody's going to put two and two together that you're a bum and nobody's going to want to help you. So in this situation, there are ways to make money in jail. I made another video. I'll put a card up here so you can check that out. There is ways to make money without having to bum off people. Another golden rule not to break. When you first get in jail, do not go around the whole pod and ask everybody what they're in for. Inmates in jail do not trust anybody. So if you're coming in jail and you're coming up to me, Hi, I'm Tim. What are you in for? That don't sound good. To me, I think somebody sent you in here, especially if I got an open case. It's a little bit different if it's somebody on your street and you get talking to them, they engaged you first, or somebody else randomly just comes up to you like, Hey, what's going on, man? I'm so-and-so, what are you in here for? That's a little bit different, you all get conversating, but you just don't go around asking people that you don't know. But in those types of situations, when I first go into a dorm, if I don't see anybody that I know, I usually don't say anything. Of what you should do if you get locked up, it might help your time go by a lot faster. Let's jump straight into it. Okay, so the first thing, as soon as you walk into the dorm, more than likely you're going to get heckled. They're going to be whistling at you, screaming stuff, especially when you got 70 or 80 guys doing it all at once. It's very intimidating, I'm not going to lie. I was intimidated the first time. There's very rare occasions that this don't happen. And that's usually if everybody's busy watching like the Super Bowl or something like that or if they bring people in in the middle of the night. 90% of the time you're going to get heckled. And once you're in there for a while, you're going to be the one doing the heckling. It's kind of like a rite of passage or a hazing. If they can look at you and see that you're scared, it's going to make things 10 times worse for you because they're literally going to eat you alive. In jail, you look for anything for entertainment. Be cool, be calm, just walk in. Even if they're heckling, just act like you don't even hear them. Just boop, pop in those earmuffs. <laughs> act like nothing's going on. Okay, so once you do get into the dorm, it brings me to the second thing, and that is make a good first impression. First impressions are everything. It don't matter if you're in the street or in the jail. If you go in jail and you act like you're a bad dude, nobody can beat you, you're the best there ever was, you're the strongest dude there is on the earth, that's not the way to go about things because you will get tested. The best thing to do is just be cool. You don't want to come off too cocky or overconfident. Just be chill, be yourself. I mean, if that's who you are in real life, then 
I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you not to be yourself, but I would hold back a little bit and not jump straight into the uh, big head. You definitely do not want to come off as a pushover, though, either. So if something was to happen, you know, you want to just let people know that you will stand up for yourself. you got to find that medium. Just be yourself, be chill. Once you get to know people, then your real personality can come out and shine, and you could take the whole dorm over. One of the most important things I can tell you is do your time, don't let your time do you. If you're worried about a wife or a girlfriend or a husband or a boyfriend, what they're doing on the outside, you're going to have a horrible time in jail. A day is going to feel like a month. It's literally going to be miserable for you. The best thing that I did while I was locked up, I limited communication. That stuff will mess with your head in jail. You have no control over what goes on outside. I've seen a lot of guys in there that get stuck on that phone. They're on there constantly calling their girl and say Friday night, Saturday night, she don't answer. He's in there going ballistic. Next thing you know, he's in the hole over something he can't control. He has no control over what she does. No matter how much you trust your significant other, when you take yourself out of the picture, your mind is going to go crazy. Even though when you're out, you have no doubt they're the most faithful person in the world, but when you get locked up, your mind just wanders and wanders and wanders. I had very minimal communication with anybody, and that was the best for me. I did my time. I soared right through it. If you make a calendar and you mark off every day, your time is going to go by so slow. You're going to be so miserable because you're like, what is going on? Like, you might only do a month, but it feels like six months. Now, once you get out, it feels like it flew by. But when you're in there, day for day, if you're marking that calendar off, that's the wrong thing to do. But the best thing to do if you want to keep a calendar, don't mark off day by day. I wouldn't even look at my calendar for two or three weeks or a month, and then when I looked at it, I would mark it all off at once, and I'd be like, man, that two weeks flew by, because I wasn't looking at the calendar every day. A very important factor of how you're going to do your time is if you can get into a good routine, especially like with a couple other people or something, if you can get out on like a workout schedule, if you don't get into a routine, you are really going to regret it because your time just going to go by so slow. I mean, what else do you got to do? What do you got to do? Sit there and think about what your old lady's doing on a Friday night? You need to get in a routine and get your time flowing, block out the outside world, do your time. Don't worry about a calendar. Don't worry about the old lady. Even if your routine is you call your old lady at 9 o'clock at night. You was in any of the holes that I've ever been in. Now, there is cameras in the hallways, but not in the actual cells. So, that's what they do. They take you to the hole because if something pops off, they don't want that stuff being on camera. One of the things that I've seen the correctional officers do to inmates is that they'll either throw them in a turtle suit for days and them turtle suits are cold even though they're not suicidal or anything like that they do it just out of fun they think it's a game messing with people's lives if you don't know what a turtle suit is it kinda makes you look like a ninja turtle there's no sides to it it's literally just like a flap jacket kinda goes down to your knees there's a front and a back and it has velcro straps that come around everyone that I have seen the velcro is so wore out it don't even stay on you so when I was serving trays whether it be a male with a turtle suit or a female with a turtle suit them turtle suits were always falling off of them and if you've never been in a hole in a county jail the hole is freezing they keep it so cold in there because they want you underneath your cover. They don't want you moving around too much. Once they take you to the hole, it's fair game. You're about to get your head wore out. I've literally watched them put inmates in there and literally just go in and two guards hold them down and one just 
beat the crap out of them. Those correctional officers will even go as far as to put people in a chair. Now the chair, it literally straps you down. It kind of, it's like a wheelchair with straps on it. They can strap your arms, your legs, and they can even strap your forehead back to this chair so you cannot move at all. They will put people in those chairs and literally just sit there and punch them over and over and over. Like, it's fun for them. They get off on this stuff. I worked in the hole for about four months, and I seen some of the most crazy things while I was in there for that four months working, just serving trays. I couldn't even count how many times they would have to make me leave because they were dealing with the situation which me leaving was I was just standing in the hallway kind of peeking around the corner. <laughs> I ain't trying to leave no action. I want to see what's going on. But when they strap people in these chairs, they'll wheel them into the cells and beat the crap out of them and then just leave them in there in a pool of their own blood called the nurse to come in and patch them up. Another thing that I've seen them do, it was pretty common, especially with the last jail that I was in, Kenton County, they would take people, put them in those chairs, and they had in the hole, there was an empty room down at the end that they kind of used for lawyer visits and stuff. They would take the person in the chair and wheel them in there, and they would let them sit for a whole shift. Sometimes I would go and serve lunch, and I would see people in that room sitting in that chair, and they're just in there screaming and hollering and, you know, because, I mean, they're strapped down, they can't move. You got somebody just sitting there playing solitaire on the computer like nothing's going on. I would serve lunch and then come back and serve dinner, and the guy's still there. He's still sitting in that chair in that room, and he hasn't ate all day. Having these inmates sit there all day and use the bathroom on themselves. And then they call an inmate like I was a trustee to come and clean it up. I think they should be the ones to clean that up. They're the ones that put the guy in the situation to make him do it. I remember seeing one guy in the hole, the guard hit him so hard that it slit the whole inside of his mouth. So the guy thought he would get back at the guard because they wouldn't take him to see the nurse or anything and his mouth just pouring blood so he starts spitting it all over the wall and writing letters and writing the guards names and they called me down there to clean it up and I'm just supposed to be serving trays stuff's crazy man these COs a lot of them not all jail and they don't necessarily have to have a problem in order to go to these programs the programs are free anybody can go to them so just in case somebody tries to tell you they can't sign up for these programs that's a lie everybody can go to the programs most of the time they just come in and they just call out the programs name and whoever wants to go they line up and go a lot of the inmates go to these programs just to get out of the cell I was one of those people I would go to certain things just so I didn't have to sit in the dorm the first program is GED Anybody without a high school diploma can sign up and get their GED while they're in jail. Now, granted, you will have to have some time in order to complete this GED because it is a process. So if you're going to be in jail for six months to a year, I would fill out for the GED. But if you're only going to be in there for a few months, there's no sense in filling out for the GED because you're not going to have enough time to complete it. But they will get you a tutor. There's people that come in, they're volunteers, they come in, they help the inmates out. They will tutor you once a week on all things that are in the GED. If you're a state inmate, meaning that you already seen the judge and you got your time, you can take this GED class and get 90 days off your sentence. But that's only as a state inmate. If you're in there as a county inmate, it will not take 90 days off your sentence. The next thing I'm going to be talking about is a psych counselor. If you are somebody that takes any kind of medication for depression or anything like that, 
or if you know somebody that is in there that takes these medications, they do offer a psych counselor. They will see you usually about once a month. They can talk to the doctor and say, I think we need to switch them from this medication to this medication, or we need to higher up the dose. That's what the counselor is there for. They're there to make sure you are okay, your medication is fine, everything's working good, you're not suicidal, stuff of that nature. The next program they have every Sunday and sometimes on Wednesdays is church. A lot of the jail population go to church, whether it be just to get out of the dorm for a little bit or they just want to go see the services. Every jail offers the church service. It's usually about an hour long, maybe hour and a half. There's usually a couple preachers that come and they're all volunteers. There is multiple church programs that go on, whether you believe in God or you're a Muslim or whatever you believe in, they usually offer those services. All the jails do Ramadan, stuff like that. So if your loved one is really religious and they stick by like the Ramadan schedule, they do have that available that will be taken care of. The next program I'm going to be talking about is life skills. I hate to disappoint everybody, but there will be no Easter Bunny if you're locked up. You will not get to go find eggs with money and candy inside. There is none of that. The church usually tries to do stuff for the inmates. Even if it's just a little something, they usually try to help the inmates out. But on Easter, nothing really changes as far as being an inmate. You're, you don't get any special treatments. Like, it's just another day to an inmate. So, I mean, of course, the inmates are on the phone a lot more because they're calling their family, wondering what they're doing. And the inmates are just depressed, man. They're missing out on their kids, getting to find the Easter eggs or grandchildren, whatever you have. Or if you don't even have children, but you're still missing out on seeing your family. You know, so the whole atmosphere is just dim and gloomy. You know, not a lot of happy people on these holidays. In some of the jails that I've been in, they will usually give you a pretty good breakfast, lunch, and dinner on these holidays. They'll kind of hook you up. They'll give you ham slices or turkey slices with gravy and, you know, mashed potatoes or, you know, whatever. They will usually give you an Easter dinner, basically. For an inmate that's been eating crummy food the whole time they've been in there, this is the best food they're going to get is when a holiday comes. So a lot of people look forward to them holiday trays. People will buy them holiday trays for a dollar. And a lot of people that don't get money, they will pre-sell their holiday tray days or weeks in advance. Because there's a lot of people that want that ham and turkey because they know they're not going to get to eat like that for a while. No good food anyway. So yes, definitely on a holiday, it is worth it to give a Raymond noodle for one tray. It's definitely worth it. I would do it all day long. Some of the guys in there will do a little bit too much, and they'll have like 10 trays, and that's just overboard if you ask me. I know it's good. Me, myself, I wouldn't want no more than two trays of it. If you don't know what indigen is, that is basically you're saying, I have no money, I need deodorant, toothpaste, stuff like that. It's free. you got to fill out for it, and they'll send it to you once a week. And it comes in a baggie or like a brown lunch bag, paper bag. But yeah, if you got access to like a Ziploc baggie, but still the food's setting out. So, I mean, unless you're going to eat it like later on that night... Me, personally, I would never save anything. Like, it's just, it's not sanitary, and jail is not a very clean place anyway, so I never save food. I would rather just give it to somebody else that's hungry, and there's tons of people in there that's hungry, so you can get rid of food. Like, it don't matter if it's one bite of something that you dropped on the floor. Somebody in there wants it. I've literally seen people, they would be the first in line for like, say, breakfast in the morning, and they would hurry up and eat, and they would take their tray up and put it back in the cart, and they would stand there and wait for other people to bring their food up, and if they had anything, 
left over on their tray, whether it be two scoops of oatmeal down. Okay, so let's jump straight into the video. The first thing we're going to get into is you don't want to walk by somebody's cell. If it's a two-man pod, you don't want to walk by and like just stare in as you walk by. People take that as extreme disrespect, and they're thinking that you're just trying to scope out what they got so you can rob them. You might run into a situation if you walk by and stare too long. You don't want to stare at an individual, period, for too long. Kind of like a quick glance and go. You don't want to stare at them. It ain't like a dog where you just stare back forever. Because this dog will come and bite you if you stare too long. That was a pretty bad analogy. But if you're in like an open dorm with just bunks, usually you have a front yard and a backyard. So if you're new to jail and you don't know how to tell if it's your front yard or backyard, you could just ask your bunkie or if he's sitting on his rack, whichever way he's facing, that's the front yard. Or there will usually be totes for your stuff, like your commissary, stuff like that. Or there will be like a little box at the bottom for your stuff. So just don't ever jump off the back. Because if you jump off the bunk on the wrong side, you're landing in another man's front yard and that's not good. That's extreme disrespect. I've seen people get into fights over jumping off on the wrong side. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to be talking about is riding chrome. Now, if you don't know that term, it's basically sitting on the stainless steel toilet. I'm sure everybody's seen memes or something of the little stainless steel toilet and sink combo. But there's just a lot of nasty people that get locked up and there's a lot of staff and everything that goes around inside the jails, infections, stuff you didn't even know you could get in there, you can get. So I would always put like five layers down. I would literally put five layers, like one layer this way, one layer this way, one this way, one across, and just repeat five times all the way around. Like I said, you never know, man. There's staff and everything. You ain't trying to get that in jail because they will not help you while you're in there. If you get help, it's because you're almost dying. Like, I've literally seen people with abscess teeth, like their whole face swelled out, and they wouldn't even help them. Not even with an ibuprofen. So, you got to be very careful about what you touch and everything else in there. Make sure you, you know, wash your hands a lot. And in a lot of these jails, they will only allow you so many flushes an hour. In almost every cell that I went into, in this one county, it would literally say, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. They won't reset it or anything like that. Heck, by the time you get somebody to reset it, it would done reset itself. Now, that's not in every jail, but it was in a few jails that I was in. You had to be very limited with your flushes. Okay, and another thing is, like, if somebody flies a kite, into your okay so the first thing we're going to be talking about if you have a loved one that is incarcerated you can get on department of corrections and there's other websites that they kind of link you to but you can be notified if there's any changes in his case or like if he makes parole it will notify you immediately if you're the inmate then you can get time sheets Usually jails will only allow you to get this like maybe once a month or every three months because they don't want everybody on the yard or in the county jail. They don't want everybody getting a timesheet five times a month when there's no changes. Now as an inmate, you really rely on your people to find out about your status on parole and stuff like that. If you don't have people on the outside, like me, I had minimal contact with the outside world. That's just how I liked it. So I didn't call people to get them to look up, see if I made parole or whatever. You know, I just didn't bother nobody. I didn't want to be a nuisance to somebody. So both times that I made parole, I didn't know that I was actually going home until the day they called my name and told me to pack it up. If you're an inmate in jail and you made parole and you didn't know prior that you had actually made parole, what will happen is they will send you to a halfway house. 
it might not be in your area they could send you to the other side of the state they'll give you a bus ticket to get there now if you knew prior you could put in a home placement to Department of Corrections so they could approve your address so you could go home instead of going to a halfway house so it's very important if you know somebody that's locked up to stay on top of that Department of Corrections especially if they're going up for parole soon you need to stay on it because they will make them go to a halfway house and then they'll have to once they get there they'll have to put in the home placement and then wait to get approved which sometimes could take a month or two and then they get to come home it's good to always go ahead like say if you're you know you're going up for parole in january i would go ahead and fill out a home placement in october just so they have it and then I would turn around and send another one in in January. You know, as an inmate, that's all you can do is keep sending in home placements and hopefully they get it and you get to go home. Okay, so if you're an inmate, you get out on parole, you get sent to a halfway house. When you get there, you will probably be on a two or three day restriction where you can't leave. And after that, you will be able to leave. You'll be able to go get a job and a lot of the halfway houses the one i was in i didn't have to pay rent or anything like that because i was there ordered by the state so all of my money was my money the whole point is they want you to save money they want you to get an apartment and get out and it goes for the same if you hit mrs now mrs you hit in between nine months and seven months of serving out your sentence if you don't have a home placement put in, they will send you to a halfway house. And another option is if you can't live with like a family member or something like that, you could always maybe see if you can get into a sober living. Like you can go from a halfway house to a sober living just to get out of the state's grasp. The sober living is basically the same. You have a curfew. You got to go to meetings, stuff like that. But you do have a little bit more. Go to court and he smacks that gavel down and gives you a five-year sentence. Then you are state property at that point. They can ship you to prison. Not all the states, but a lot of the states are one year and under. You stay at the county jail. One year and one day, you go to prison. Now, some states like Kentucky, where I'm from, if you have a nonviolent crime under seven years, they will send you to a work camp. You will work for the county. But if you have a violent crime, you automatically go to prison. They do this because the prisons are so overpopulated, they don't have nowhere to put people. A few ways that you can separate the two. Jail is for people that have short time or minor crimes. Prison is for people that have a lot of time and major crimes. Them are the main differences between the two. And of course, the people that are in prison had to be in county jail. But if you have a violent charge like that, usually they're going to keep you in like a maximum security wing, keep you separated from GP, from all the people that are in there for like DUIs and public intoxication, stuff like that. Usually, jails can only house like 1500 inmates or under a lot of the jails I was in only housed like 500 to 900 inmates now prison on the other hand can hold thousands of inmates if you're doing short time you would want to stay at the county jail because you would want to stay close to your family and everything else now if you're going to be doing like a good stretch like I did five years in the county jail it sucked I ain't gonna lie to you it sucked so if you're only going to do a short period of time, you would want to stay at the county jail, stay close to your family, do what you got to do and get out. But if you're going down for something big, you definitely want to go to prison just because it's set up for the long stretches. There's a lot more to do. You get wrecked daily. County jail, you don't get wrecked daily. I did five years in county jail and we never got wrecked every day. If we were lucky, we would get it three times a week. And the wreck in county jail, they just take you to a room that has an open ceiling with like steel netting over the top of it. So you can look up and see the clouds and stuff, but you're looking through, looks like a fence. 
or like a screen. Now in county jail, you never get rec seven days a week like you're supposed to. You're supposed to get one hour out every day. That never happens. You will be lucky if you get it three or four times. I've seen it where you didn't go out at all for a whole week. Just because the guards act like they're so busy that they can't transport you from one cell to another. Because that's basically what they're doing. All it is is just a big open room with no ceiling. It's like got like a mesh steel screen over top of it, I guess. And you can see the clouds and stuff, but you're looking through a screen. So, you know, like you ain't really getting no sun or anything like that. Now, prison is set up with like a big yard, workout area, laps. You got all kinds of room in prison versus county jail. You're just in another room probably a few times the size of your pod. Now, jail, you can only get what they give you. You can't get nothing else other than ordering off commissary. And their commissary is very limited, and each jail you go to, their commissary will be different. Now, prison, on the other hand, they have a larger selection, like probably five times the selection of a county jail. It's basically the same food, but they just got a bigger variety, and they have access to where inmates work in the kitchen and stuff like that. They can smuggle back in, like, fresh fruit and fresh vegetables, stuff like that, to the inmates where they can buy it. Versus in jail, you don't have that kind of access because hallway boys ain't trying to get locked down over a tomato. Jail does have a lot of that end up just popping up out of nowhere. And I would sew those up because I didn't have nobody out on the streets helping me out. So I had to do what I had to do. All right, let's jump straight into it. All you need to sew is just like on the streets, you need a needle and thread. But you can't get needles off commissary, and you can't get thread off commissary. So you got to come up with something. When you get locked up, most jails will give you an antigen pack that comes with deodorant that I don't suggest you wear because it stinks to high heaven, makes you smell worse. And they give you toothpaste, toothbrush, and a comb. Now, the comb, I don't have one exactly like it, but, uh, you know, you'll get the point. Uh, it looks like that. You need one of these little bristles, just one. I've already cut a bristle off here. Now you want to take the big end, and I used to just bite it. Bite it, and you want to you want to flatten this back piece out. So make sure your little pointy end is at the other end, and you just bite it, bite down on it. A little tougher than what I remember. <laughs> if you can find a different way to smash this down, I would definitely suggest it. But all you want to do is just flatten it out so it looks like that. I hope y'all can see that. Okay, so next, all you need is a pen or a pencil. Usually the jails, a lot of them don't want to give you pens like this. They will give you those stupid flex pens but it still has the little end on it. So what I would take, I would take the pen, and what you want to do is, is you want to put it right in the middle and just press down on it so you get like a divot and just push as hard as you can. I would use my steel rack. I would pull my mat up and do it on that. And then you'll have to flip it over and repeat right in the center. Same thing. And, you know, after doing it a couple times, you will get a hole. Okay. So... I already went ahead and pre-did one because it does take a f quite a few tries of doing that. I didn't want you all sitting here watching me for a long period of time trying to poke a hole in this little piece of plastic. There is a small hole there. I don't know if you all can see it, but there is a small hole in there. Okay, so next, you need string. Now, on the uniforms, you know, you got your black and whites or orange and whites. Uh, heck, I've seen them green and white. But they have real big, thick seams that go down the arms and down the legs. The whole, every uniform has them. But they have big stitching. All you got to do is get that, just rip one of the stitches and literally just pull it out all the way down. And worst case scenario... 
you get a big hole when you tell them you need a new uniform. I always pulled it out and I never had a problem with my uniform falling apart. Those uniforms are made really, really well. So once you get your string and you got your needle now, you just put it through there, tie it up, and you're ready to sew. Probably should have used a bigger piece of string, but you all get the idea. And once I would get it through there like that, because see how thick that is? I would actually take and bite it back down the other way so it makes it thinner. It will look like that, because if you leave that poked out like that, you're just going to put a hole in your shirt almost the size of the hole that you're trying to cover up. So I would definitely bite that back down. But yes, that is what you will end up with. Okay, so I have an old work shirt. I just want to give you a quick example. See, it's got two holes. That's what I'm talking about. It's just from being washed or something, just too much. You know, the material starts to break down after a while. I mean, you literally just do it like regular needle and thread. Okay, it's a horrible stitch job, but you get the point.